ayudar. En qué estamos. Aleluya. I'm going to be. I'm going to try to be brief. I'll try. <laughs> the message itself is not very brief. But the Lord woke me up with these thoughts just about two days ago or so. Because I was still contemplating, will I preach or not? Will I get another minister, a female minister, to, to preach this time? Uh, because I want as much as possible also for you guys to have the opportunity to develop your wings and cut your teeth in ministry. Like I said last Sunday, the expression house has been set up for that purpose. And like one of our sisters said to me in the UK two years ago, the expression house is a sending place where men and women are made and sent forth to the nations of the earth to go and do exploits for Christ. But the Lord gave me these thoughts. And in the course of the service today, I have seen the confirmation from the medley to the prayer time to the praise worship, even to the dance ministration. Everything in sync to the hymn. There's a particular line in the hymn. When I get to that part in my message, I'll remind you. And I didn't compare notes with the choir. I didn't even talk to them. I didn't talk to media. Now, this is what I'm preaching about. I didn't give them a title. I didn't give them anything. The spirit of the Lord is one. And I believe that he's about to do something in somebody's life today. Both of those who are here physically and those who are with us online. The Lord will visit you in the name of Jesus. He gave me these thoughts and I jumped up out of bed quickly to go write it down in my parchment where I write. And interestingly, my sermon note was with me at home. He said to me, the Holy Spirit, the believer's advantage. That's what he gave me. The Holy Spirit, the believer's advantage. Go with me to Act of the Apostles. First of all, to Malachi chapter 3, 1 to 3. And then to Act of the Apostles 2, 1 to 4. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, see the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth. For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Go with me to Act of the Apostles chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. Act of the Apostles chapter 2 from verse 1. To fall. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Somebody say one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were seated, or where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. You remember the fire from Malachi. And it sat upon each of them. You remember the refiner's fire sitting upon them in Malachi and in Act of the Apostles, he said the fire actually sat upon them. A manifestation and a fulfillment of that which had been prophesied. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And he sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit Give them utterance. Lord, I yield myself to you completely to give me utterance today so I can bring your counsel to your children, to your people, all 
all around the globe. Wherever people are being connected to this service, let Jesus be magnified. And you, precious Father, you get all the glory. As I use myself completely to you, Holy Spirit, to help me. In Jesus' name. Amen. God's gift to the world is Jesus. The gift of God to the world at large. John 3.16 tells us, for God so loved the world. He didn't say the church. He said the world. He gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. So God's gift to the world at large. Everybody that makes up the world is Jesus Christ. However, God's gift to the church is the Holy Spirit. And I have an amen to that. When God gave his son, he gave his best, the very best that he had. But when he gave the Holy Spirit, he gave his all. I began to ponder on these thoughts as the Lord gave these words to me and began to look at my own life, examine my life, and by extension, looking at the church. And I can confidently say, even though not very happy to say, that we are not taking advantage of the pressing of the Holy Spirit. We are not taking advantage of the blessings that he carries, his pressing, his ministry, and all of the gifts and all of the fruit. We are not taking advantage of what he carries enough. That's why we live in defeat. That's why Satan seems to be having a field day in our lives sometimes. And it is time for the church to arise and take our place. Not just the expression house. When I say the church, I mean the body of Christ as a whole of which we are a part. That's the central message in this message this morning. To get the church to come to that point where we begin to maximize the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Towards the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus, he spoke to the disciples about the Holy Spirit and how important it was for him to go to the Father so that this all-important Holy Spirit would come. The church was going to be born and God didn't want a powerless, joyless, visionless church. God didn't want a paperless church. God wanted a church full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is also known as patience. Or patience endurance, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You'll find all these fruits in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. And we have been studying that for a while now in Bible study. God wanted the church that would be full of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So everywhere you look, in our brethren, in all of us, and look at my sister, I see the fruit of the Spirit. You look at me, you see the fruit of the Spirit. If the church rises to that point, strife will not have room amongst us. And where there is strife, usually you'll find envy there. And the Bible says you'll find all manner of evil work. Why are people jealous of one another in the church? Why do people backbite one another in the church? Why do we kill our wounded soldiers in the church? Because we are not manifesting and we are not growing. We are not cultivating the fruit of the spirit. Why are we in rancor? Because we are not growing the fruit of the spirit. In Acts chapter 2 that we read, verses 1 to 4, the Bible says, Amongst other things, they were in one accord. At least 120 people. Been there for many days, and yet they were in one accord. Only one service. Few of us, and we are hardly ever able to be in one accord. Why? Because we are neglecting this person and what he carries. And what he has to offer the church. So God wants a church that will be full of the manifestation of the fruit of the spirit. Also, God wants a church. That we flow in the power gifts, in the utterance gift, and in the revelation gifts. According to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10. 
you will find those gifts. We call them the, the, uh, the gift of the spirit or ministry gift. No, not ministry gifts, spiritual gifts. Ministry gifts are different from spiritual gifts. Ministry gifts are people like us. And all of you that have the calling of God upon your life. The five-foot ministry. The, the apostle, the, the, the prophet, the, the pastor, uh, the, the teacher, the evangelist. We call them the ministry gifts. Ministers of God generally are called ministry gifts. But spiritual gifts are gifts of the spirit. Which the Holy Spirit distributes to every man severally according to his own will. We find that in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, by extension to us, he said, brethren, I would not have you ignorant of spiritual gifts. These gifts are nine in number, but they are categorized into three. Three of them say something, three of them do something, three of them reveal something. All of these gifts should be manifestation in our services. Can I have an amen to that? All of them should be in manifestation in our lives. I don't mean one person manifesting nine. Everybody being given their own portion by the Holy Ghost. But are we hungry and are we thirsty for them? Do we want more of the Holy Spirit? Many don't even know the Holy Spirit. They, they've gone to church for 10 years. They've never heard of the Holy Spirit. They only see his picture in calendars. And the picture they see is that of a dove. That is about to land on the cross or land on the globe. They said, that is the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he has all the characteristics of a person. He has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions. That's why the Bible tells us to not grieve him. That's why the Bible says he distributes this gift according to his will. First Corinthians and chapter 12. So, we need to begin to acquaint ourselves and familiarize ourselves with this all-important person. We can't fulfill our destiny in Christ without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We can't be a healthy church without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If we're already healthy, we won't be healthier if we don't take advantage of the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord said to me, the Holy Spirit, the believer's advantage. God wanted the church that would manifest his kingdom, power and glory. His love and compassion. A church that would walk in dominion over every power of darkness. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, can we have that very quickly on the screen? Quickly, Luke 10, 19, when the Lord was speaking to his disciples, he made this very powerful statement. Luke 10, 19. He said, behold, let's read it together, everybody. One, two, go. Behold, I give unto you what? Power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Actually, the Greek word translated power there is also translated authority. Authority. Authority is the right to use power. The right. Now, if you carry a gun, for example, and you bring a gun to this service, and you are not a policeman, you are not from DSS, you are not in secret service, now, that would be an unauthorized action. That would be illegal. Illegal possession of firearms. If we find out, we can arrest you. But if you're a member, if you're a staff, if you are if you belong to the Nigerian police or to the Nigerian army, and you carry that, you are authorized to carry it. The gun you carry is power. The right to carry that gun is authority. Why do you stop when the policeman stops you on the road? When you are driving. You are driving and then a policeman flags you down and says, stop! You see the uniform. That uniform is Nigerian government. That uniform is the federal government of Nigeria. Whether he carries a gun or not, you stop. Because that's authority. Then if he has a gun, that's power. Some people can have power. But if you don't have authority to use that power, then it becomes illegal. Jesus said, I have given you authority. Amen? In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Here, he said, I've given you authority. To tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. And a few things will hurt you. A few things might hurt you. What did he say will hurt you? Is there anything authorized to hurt you? So if anything is trying to hurt you, what are you supposed to do? 
run away, beg it to please go. What are you supposed to do? Hallelujah. You tread on it. Slap it down. Cast it down. Tread on it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Can I have an amen to that? That's the kind of church that God wants. A church that works in power, authority, dominion, kingdom, glory. I see a church. I see an expression of imagine a glorious church in the name of Jesus. We will emerge in glory in the name of Jesus. God wanted a church that will be led by his spirit. Receive instructions from him and excel in every aspect. Bringing glory to his holy name. Romans 8, 14 tells us as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In the message translation, it says God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and there are places to go. May you be led by the Holy Spirit. It's a very powerful prayer. I just prayed for you. May you be led by the Holy Spirit. One can be stranded without the leading of the Holy Spirit. The solution might be just next to you like this and you're looking, you're traveling far to go and get the solution. Whereas it's just next door. Many, many times our inability to hear from him is a source of discomfort, a source of distress, a source of hazard. I want to help you this morning to be a little more sensitive to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To be a little more grateful for him as a person. Not just what he carries. And then for his ministry. The more you appreciate his ministry, the more you are able to flow with him. The more you realize that he's a person and not a bird, the better you are able to relate to him. When you know that somebody is a person, you can relate to the person, right? Do you relate to your friends the same way you relate to your pets? If you have a pet at home, like you have a dog, can you tell your dog now, oh, yeah, come, come over here. Now you're going to have to go with me to the cinema. But before we go to the cinema, can you go to the market and get me some stuff? Now, right now, I'm not feeling too good. Can you just encourage me? The guy can't speak. So he can't encourage you. He can bark or maybe wag its tail. But he can't really encourage you on the same level. When you begin to relate to the Holy Spirit as a person, he begins to minister to you. Let me not go ahead of myself. Let me go very quickly because I want to finish this today. Glory be to God. But listen. But of all this, all of this would not be possible. All of these things that God wants for his church to be. A church that has power, a church in glory, a church led by the spirit, a church that has a vision. All of this would not be possible without the Holy Spirit. He is God's gift to the church. Say with me, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to the church. He's not God's gift to the world. That's why an unbeliever cannot receive the Holy Spirit. He has to be born again. He has to come to Christ and then receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? He has to hear the word of God and faith comes. And as faith comes and then he gets born again, then the Holy Ghost comes. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is God's gift to the church. That makes us special. That should make us feel special. That God has a special gift for us. Exclusively for us. Go to John 16 and verse 7. Let's read a few scriptures. John chapter 16 and verse 7. This will help you for a very, very long time. For as long as you remain in the faith and walk with God. John 16 and verse 7. Thank you, media. You're doing a great job. Jesus speaking there. If you have a red letter Bible, you find these words in red letters. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, if you read the previous verse, verse 6. He said, but because I've said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. How can you tell us that you want to go? How can you tell us that you have to go? Don't go now. We have been together for the past three and a half years. We have seen miracles upon miracles. We've enjoyed miracles. You have, we have seen you multiply loaves of bread and fishes. We've seen you raise the dead. We've seen you recover sight to the blind. We've seen you open the, 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 the ears of the deaf. You've loosed the tongue of the dumb. You've performed all manner of miracles. You've walked on water. There was a time you were walking on water, we were afraid, and, and, and you came to us. And as soon as you got into the boat, the boat got to our destination. 
supernatural acceleration. Ah, we've seen you do all manner of things. There was a time that the storm was going to capsize our boat. Life was almost ebbing away. And we woke you up and you rebuked the wind and you spoke to the sea. Now you say you want to go. Go where? Sorrow filled their heart. But Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. <laughs> hey, it is important. It is to your advantage that I go. How can it be? When somebody has been a blessing to your life, you don't want such a person to go. There are certain people that come to your life, when they go, you throw a Thanksgiving party. Ah, Father, I bless your name. I'm free. The snare is broken and my soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. Glory be to God. Because such a person is a lesson. There are people that are lessons in our lives. But there are some people that go and you cry. You don't want them to go. Why? Because they are a blessing. In life, you are either a blessing or a lesson. To the disciples, was Jesus a lesson or a blessing? But the blessing said to them, it is expedient for you that I go away. Can you give me that in Amplified Classic? Quickly. Let's look at it. However, I am telling you nothing but the truth when I say it is profitable. Maybe we don't get expedient. It is profitable. It is good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you even say that? He said, because if I do not go away, the comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby, will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send them to you to be in close fellowship with you. Somebody say, thank you, King Jesus. Jesus could only be in a place at a time. If he was in Capernaum, at home in Capernaum, he was not in Judea. He was not in Jerusalem. He was not in Samaria. He could only be at a location per time. They would read in the, in the Gospels that they would say, ah, Master, where have you been? Because all men seek for you. Why? Because he could be at a place at a time during his earthly ministry. But today, King Jesus is everywhere in the person of the Holy Spirit. Can I have an amen? amen. At least there are about four, five churches on this campus alone. One, two, three, maybe about three on this floor, on this building. Maybe about three or two. And then another one over there. And the Holy Spirit is in each of these services. That's why Jesus said it's expedient. For you, that I go away so I can send him. Because if I don't go, he won't come. I need to make room for him to come. Are you making room for the Holy Ghost in your life? Are you making room for him? Or the Holy Spirit is only meant for our worship time. When the choir sings about the Holy Spirit, oh yeah. So there is one Holy Spirit. It is to our disadvantage that we are not listening to him. It is to our disadvantage that we are not fellowshipping with him. But that will begin to change from this morning in the name of Jesus. John 14, 26 to 27. Jesus speaking about the comforter. He keeps calling him the comforter. The Greek word paraklet or parakletos. Which means another like me. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you a few things. Come on, talk to me this morning. He shall teach you how many things? All things. How many things are all things? Everything is all. How many is every? All. How many is all? Every. No exception. You want to know about relationship? Can it teach you? You want to know about your career? Can it teach you? You want to know about your business? Can it teach you? You want to know about your body? How your body functions? Can it teach you? You want to know about what to eat? What not to eat? Can it teach you? You want to know about your future? Can it teach you? You want to know how to raise children? Can it teach you? You want to know how to prosper? Can it teach you? It can teach you. Because the Bible says he will teach you all things. But what if you don't ask him? What if you don't make room for the teacher? What if you know it all? <laughs> I have learned very bitter lessons in that area. What if you assume that you know everything? 
it is wisdom for us to know that we don't know much. And to be humble before the Lord and allow him to teach us. You can be talking theory. When crunch time comes, that is when practical will come out. It's time for practical. Anybody can talk about buns in Bona, acid and base, litmus paper. <laughs> you have heard of effervescence. You have heard of uh, 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 com, com. what do they call that thing that comes from sulfur? That odor. Pungent. Pungent smell. You can read that in chemistry textbook. But get into the laboratory. That is when practical actually comes. Have you ever seen an acid before? Have you seen a base before? That's the way life is. There's a time you are talking theory, you are talking theory, you know. There are single people who are teaching other people how to run marriage. They are teaching them how to be married and how to marry right and how to get it right. You will get it right. If you do this formula, one, two, three, put it together. <laughs> Have you been there? So, Sherry, I've been told that when you want to sell medicine to an Hausa man, I like the Hausa people in Nigeria, the Hausa man will ask you, this medicine you want to sell to me, this ailment in my body, have you had it before? Before you sell the wrong medicine to me? Maybe it's headache, but have you had my kind of headache before? Have you been there? Americans will say, I've been there. I've been there, done that. You can't tell me nothing. There is the theory part of life. But then there is the practical. So those of you who are still in the theory, enjoy it. But then build strength. And learn to begin to fellowship with the Holy Ghost. So that when the practical comes, you will not fall like a pack of cards. In the day of adversity, may the Lord strengthen you. Jesus said he will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever. Mark this word. I will come back to them. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the word giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Can I have an amen to those words? And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The Lord Jesus speaking. He said, but you shall receive power. Come and give that to me on the screen, please. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power. That's dunamis. God's self-charging power. After that the Holy Ghost is come. Not before. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. Can I have an amen to that? That's Jesus introducing the ministry. And the person of the Holy Spirit. To his disciples. He told them he will teach you all things. He told them he will remind you my words. Because there are certain times that may come in your life. Certain seasons that may come. And you will forget what I have said. But the Holy Ghost will remind you. Ah, God's people. Have you ever been reminded of something that you used to know? Anybody here? Somebody said something to you and you say, ah! I used to know that. I knew that. I even preached it myself. And they are using it to preach to you. The Holy Ghost will remind you the words that I speak to you, Jesus said to the disciples. I move on very quickly this morning. Then, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, one of our texts that we read this morning, the church was born. This is where it has to do with the hymn that the choir took this morning. There's a line, I think the last verse of that hymn. Can, can, can the media please project it? Can you do that for me very quickly? The last verse of the hymn. The hymn that we read. Uh, sorry, that we sang this morning. Uh, praise the Father, praise the Son. The last, the last verse. Verse 4. And the church of God was born. Is that right? And the church of Christ, thank you. And the church of Christ was born. Then the spirit lit the flame. Uh -huh. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. And the church of Christ was born. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost came. Boom. And a new breed of people emerged. 
people full of the Holy Ghost. He was not just on the inside of them. He came upon them. He came upon them. Empowered them to carry on the work. The church. The church was not born a very weak church. The church was not born a weakling. The church was not born paperless and powerless and joyless and visionless and purposeless. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Wherever the head goes, the body follows. Are you with me? Why are we missing it? Where are we missing it? And these are questions I've had to ask myself. Why and where? Where have I missed it? And why? It must be because at certain points in our lives, we thought we knew it all. And didn't listen to him. Gave us an instruction and we ignored him. Sometimes, he will lead you by the inward witness. He won't speak to you, but he will give you an inward witness. Don't join company with this person. Don't do business with this person. Don't da, 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 da. don't go there. But you, say, ah, you ignore. They invited me now. Ah, I will go there. And that's it. From today, may we become sensitive again to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Part of our confession. One line there says, my spirit is attuned to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. May that be your portion. May that be your portion. Some people have been desensitized. They don't even know when the Holy Spirit is talking to them. Those of us who have been desensitized, may God remove that desensitization and sensitize you again. Let me now talk very quickly about some of the advantages that the believer stands to gain when we walk with the Holy Spirit, when we commune with him, when we come into intimacy with him. One of the advantages the believer has is called guidance. Somebody say guidance. G-U-I-D-A-N-C-E. That's different from guardians. Oh, guardian. This is guidance from the word guide. A guide is different from a guard. A guard, G-U-A-R-D, keeps your life or property secure and safe. Guard. But a guide leads you. A guide shows you what you don't know, where you don't know. Especially when you go to an unfamiliar terrain. The world is a very large place. You can go to a place that is new and you don't know your left from your right. One of my friends went to school in Scotland. She said one day she almost froze. Because she almost couldn't recognize where she was going. All the buildings looked alike. You know the way overseas, the way they develop their countries. Overseas, the same thing in America. I said that happened to me before also. In the night, I was coming from the Southwest Believers Convention. They, uh, 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 some people gave me a ride. <laughs> Excuse me. Some ministers. And I slept off in the car. By the time the GPS said we had arrived at our destination, and I got out of the car, I didn't know the house. All the houses look alike. And I've forgotten the number. And they had dropped me. Thank God that they didn't leave. So they had to check again. And then we had to check our phones and check and check and check. And then I called somebody. And then we were able to find the house. Because every house was the same. Same design, same pattern, same everything. You need a guide sometimes. Life is an unfamiliar terrain. You need a guide. And the guide you need is the Holy Spirit. Some people... Internet is their guide. Some people, they are friends. My bestie is my guide. Whatever she tells me, that's what I do. Hmm? <laughs> hey! Don't gamble with your life. When you go to a game reserve, life is like a game reserve. In a game reserve, you have wild animals, untamed. You can have a lion walking about freely. It's a game reserve. You have hippopotamus. You have cheetah. You have all kinds of animals. And they are roaming all over the place. Or some of them keep quiet and they calm. They calm down in a particular spot. You need a tourist guide. When you go to Yankari Game Reserve, for example, in the north, you need a tourist guide that will take you on the tourist bus and will tell you, you see that place? There is a lion there. Say, I can't see any lion. Let me go down and see it. All right? We'll see you later. <laughs> because when you see the lion and the lion sees you, God bless the lion and God bless you. You know what I mean? Life is like that. 
hey, don't take that right turn. There is a python there, and that guy is very wicked. The name of that python is Lucifer. Hey. You don't want to go there. Say, I, but I can't see it. Uh, uh, unless I see, I won't believe. Sin is believing. Okay, then you. That's why people go down. They say, sin is believing. People of Thomas, Thomas's faith. Say, unless I see, I will not believe. <laughs> you need guidance. Some of the guidance. Romans 8, 14 to 16. Romans 8, 14 to 16. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 15. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That witness is called the inward witness. Somebody say inward witness. I don't know how better to explain it than to say an inward knowing. It's just a knowing in your spirit. It's like a traffic light in your spirit man. That when you want to do something, or you want to go somewhere, or you want to join forces with someone, it just shows you the red light. So don't ever have anything to do with this person. It is not because they are bad. And it's not because you are bad. It's not because what you are planning to do with them is bad, but it is not going to be to your advantage. It might hurt you. God will still show mercy. Amen? Because the merciful God, that's the thing that nobody understands about God. After we have read, we've read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, you still discover that you still don't know all that you need to know about God. When we get to heaven, we'll still be discovering God. Are you with me? You can know him through and through. You can know everything. You can know the totality of God. That's why it's God. You look at certain people, you say, this person doesn't deserve mercy. Should have died like 16 years ago. They're still alive. Bouncing all over the place. And you see someone else that you think, ah, this one should live long and, and they're gone. No doubt. You don't understand. The spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Are you a child of God? How did you get to know you're a child of God? By the spirit. There's a witness in me that I am a child of the most high God. I belong to Jesus. Somebody say, I belong to Jesus. I am glad I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I belong. Oh, I am glad I belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. Divine guidance. Isaiah 30, 21. The Bible says, and you shall hear a voice behind you. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. For mm -mm, mm -mm. Isaiah 30, 21. 30, 21. 30, verse 21. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. He said, your ears shall hear a word behind you. That's divine guidance. May you hear the voice of God. The voice of God is not always the voice of the people, though. Some people said the voices of the people or the voice of the people is the voice of God. I've never seen that in the Bible. People can clamor for something, but that's not God's plan for them. They clamored for chicken. Give us fowl. Give us chicken. We are tired of this manna. Manna. Manna, manna. Oh, how we miss the garlic of Egypt, the cucumber. The fish. Oh, fresh fish of Egypt. You this wicked Moses. You brought us to this wilderness and you are giving us this manna. Manna. Does that sound like food? What manner of man is this Moses? Oh, deep God. Amen. Praise God. They cried to God for meat and he ran down chicken. One person had over 25,000 to himself. The chicken filled all their camp. Oh, they were very happy. They began to key and roast. They made barbecue. They made pepper soup. They made fried one. They everything. Oh, you know there are different ways to eat chicken. Some of you, the only chicken you eat is fried chicken. Your chicken is boring. I don't like it. Grilled. Make it, make it grilled. Grill. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Grilled chicken. Grill it sometimes. Eh? Sometimes you fry. Sometimes you just dry. Just, just smoke it. Smoke it. Have you eaten smoked chicken before? 
So they made variety of chicken. And as they were eating it, it was coming out from their noses and their ears. Because it was not the will of God for their lives. Somebody can be hell bent on something that is not God's plan for their lives. Can be in a relationship and God said, that's not your relationship. He said, no, I love him. I love her. I love you. You, you don't know how it feels. Pastor, when somebody is in love, when you're in love, in love. <laughs> oh, hey, that course you want to study, that's not the one for you. This one, you are wired for this one. I told somebody, I said, music is your line. What are you doing with, with acting? She said, I like acting, Pastor. I just want to be an actor. I just want. And I said, look, when you stand to minister, I've heard you sing and I know that your voice is unique. You know, there's some people that have this kind of voice that travels very far. I said, I see you in the class of people like Sinash and some of these other people. Hey, she said, I know Pastor God has gifted me, but acting is my thing. Recently, I asked her. I said, how ah, about the acting? They said, ah, Pastor, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm staying with my music now. I'm staying with my music. You have a job now, even as a music person. How much has acting paid you? You know, but sometimes there's a difference between what God has wired you for and what you are desiring. And because that desire is not coming from the Holy Spirit. It's not coming from the place of meditating in the Word. Because when you meditate in the Word, the Holy Spirit will affect what you desire. Jesus said in John 15, and I think it's verse 7, from verse 5 actually, he said, if you dwell in me and my words dwell in you, then you will ask whatever you will and it will be done. Now, it's not just that you will ask whatever you will. You will be asking because his word dwell in you. So the word will affect what you desire. Are you with me? I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Yes. Move on. What verse is that? Okay. Go to verse 5. The, the previous one. Previous verse. If it's not there, we'll go to the next one. Okay. Next one. Next one. Now, next one. Next one. Verse 7. Verse 7, actually. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Because the words that abide in you will affect your desire. And when you make your request known to him based on your desire, which is based on his word, he will not say no to his word. Are you with me? Are you with me, church? You know, many things influence our desires. Many things. What we see, the internet, people around, our environment, you know, somebody got it, I also want to get it. But you never ask God whether it is meant for you. The Holy Spirit. Kai. The Holy Spirit. Guidance. Yeah. Here we hear a voice. Isaiah 58, 11. Thank God that fasting is ongoing. This is one of the benefits of fasting. Isaiah 58 and verse 11. You will enjoy supernatural guidance. Amen. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. Can I have an amen to that? And satisfy your soul in drought. And make fat your bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden. And like a spring of water. Whose waters fail not in the mighty name of Jesus. He said the Lord shall guide thee continually. 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 May you not get to a point in your life where you stop being guided by God. That's the error of some people. That was the error of Saul the king. He was guided to a point to go and destroy the Amalekites. Then he went there, destroyed them, but saved Agag, their king, and saved the best animals. He stopped being guided. And that terminated his kingdom. He went on to be king for another 38 years, but he had been rejected from the second year of his reign. Because he had stopped being guided. May you not become too big in your own eyes. When God sent Samuel, uh, Samuel the prophet to him, Samuel said to him, when you were little, First Samuel 15, when you were little in your own eyes, did I not promote you? When you were small, ah, God, may you help me to be small in my own eyes. I pray that for you. May God help you to be small in your own eyes. When you are big and you think everything is happening because of you, 
I know what I'm putting into that ministry. I know my efforts. I know what I'm doing. I know the amount of money that goes alone from me. I, I, know, I know my finances. I know my sacrifices. Who are you? All the things that you are giving and that you have given, who gave you? The Bible says, what is it that a man has that he has not received? If you have received it, why are you acting as though you did not receive it? Why are you talking like the source? Are you the fountain of life? Psalm 36 verse 9 says, for with you is the fountain of life, and in your life shall we see life. Are you the father of all spirit? Are you the father of all light? James 1 17, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the father of heavenly light, with whom there is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. Let's be humble. Even when God is using you to feed 1,000 people, know that you are not the source. Are you with me, church? May you continue to be guided by the Holy Spirit. That's why David the psalmist wrote in Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Twice he said, leadeth, leadeth. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. Is it that God leads you or he leads you? You cannot, God cannot be led by you. Can I have an amen? Is it that your numero uno or is nothing? As I'm talking to you this morning, I'm talking to myself. I'm also saying, Lord, help me in certain areas where I've taken decisions without consulting you. Where I thought, oh, holy scurry, holy bolly, this is the good one. Boom! This is one that looks good. That looks good. <laughs> we have forgotten many men that we forget that we don't walk by. We are not configured anymore to walk by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7. It says we walk by faith and not by sight. And God is a faithful God. God is a God of faith. Let me go on very quickly. Divine guidance can save your life. It can save you from putting your, your, your resources into a failed venture. No wonder the psalmist cried out in Psalm 31 verse 3. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. For your name's sake, Lord, lead me and guide me. That's Psalm 31 and verse 3. In Psalm 36 and verse 9, he said, For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light shall we see light. It's in your light that I see light. I don't have light of my own. It's in your light that I see light. Like the moon radiates the light of the sun. It's in your light that I see light. And James 1, 17 calls him the father of heavenly light. In Psalm 27 verse 1, David the psalmist said, The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. He is my leader. Light shows you the way. When there's a python on the way and in the night, you are walking on a narrow path and a car is coming and beams his light on that path and you see the python. What do you do? You escape for your life. God sent that light to show you that there is danger there. So you don't go and step on a rattlesnake waiting to be stepped upon so you can strike. May the Lord guide you continually. Mm. May the Lord guide us continually. <laughs> Listen to me, but I'm, I'm also in another, I'm in, a, I'm in an advanced school of thought now. In my relating to God. And I'm in a point where I'm asking questions that I never used to ask. And it's a sign of growth, really. There were certain questions you asked when you were five. When you were six, seven. When you were three. Mommy, I want to eat. Where is my food? Do you still go to mommy and say, Mommy, I want to eat. Where is my food? You go to the kitchen and cook yourself some meal and say, Mommy, what would you like to eat? There was a time, Mommy, I want to eat. Where is my food? Now, it's, Mommy, what would you like to eat? I'm making some noodles. Do you mind some? And I'm making some pepperoni. Do you like it? As a guy, there was a time. You used to run around with, with tires and play with toys. A time comes, you sit down with your dad and say, Dad, when a man begins to have a feeling for a woman, I mean, that is a, what? What level are you in school? I said, Daddy, 200 level. So now you are talking to me with baritone. Daddy, 200 level. No, that is, is no, I mean, this is, you know, that is, a, okay, 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 let's calm down. Uh, actually, you know, it's not, I sent you to school. Jumbo, my son, I sent you to school. You have to know how to write your name. <laughs> Go and face what I sent you to school for. But if you want to talk to a lady, there are technicalities. Now, you are talking as man to man. 
you are asking questions now that you never used to ask. It, it shows that you are growing. There are certain questions my son is asking. I said, mm, okay, I have, to be, I have to think twice to answer him. Not just give him an answer. He will confuse the man. So I asked the question. I asked the Lord a question. And I, I wrote it down. I said, so what happens when I miss my way? Because for the most part, most of the preachings we hear, they say, don't miss it, don't miss it, don't, 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 don't miss it, don't miss it. You'll be guided, you'll be guided, you'll be guided. What happens when I now lose my way? Because does it happen or not? How do I get out from here? How do I move from where I am to where I'm supposed to be? Even though I've missed my way. Should I go and commit suicide? Should I kill myself? And this is what happens when people don't have anybody to talk to. They don't know what to do. They miss their way and they're in the middle of nowhere and nobody's willing to even listen to them. And Oh, more, I have my own story there. I have my own life. I have my own problems. What do I do from here? And where there is no guidance, they just take their lives. And then everybody starts crying. Oh, and she texted me. Oh, and she said she wanted to see me. Hey, what do I do when I miss my way? I've heard you, Lord. You said I should not miss my way. Thank you, Father. I will not miss my way. But if it happens, what do I do? <laughs> Sometimes when I'm listening to preachers now, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, talk, 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 talk. For example, I'll give you an, another example of a question I asked the Lord recently. John 14, 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I've preached it myself. I've taught it. Let not your heart be troubled. And let it not be afraid. Have you heard me say that before? And you, you, you must have had me say, if your heart is troubled, who allowed it to get that way? You did, right? You remember that? Okay, that's fine. But now, there is trouble in my heart. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. But now, there are people listening to me who have trouble in their heart. Their heart is already troubled. What should they do? Are you with me? That's a higher level of thinking. It's not just don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't, don't, oh, but it, now I have done the don't. Is that the end of it all? Should I end it? Let me move on very quickly. So I asked the Lord this question, so what happens when I miss my way? Is it the end of the world? Should I put an end to it? Should I commit suicide? The answer is no! So what do I do? And I heard the Lord said to me, cry out to God for help. When you've missed your way, cry out to God for help. Very easy. You cry to people. But hey, there is an almighty God in heaven who also is in your heart. Cry out to God for help. It's nearer than you think. Psalm 46 verse 1 tells us God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the day of trouble. Is he very present? Is he near to us? God is nearer than we know. Cry out to God for help. As you do. Now listen. This is what he told me. He said as you do. As you cry out to God for help. The Holy Spirit will help you recalibrate. It will help you recalibrate. What do I mean? It will help you retrace your steps from where you are to where you ought to be. It may nudge you to take a step or take a particular action. It may speak directly to your heart or simply lead you by the inward witness. Sometimes, it will simply remind you of the words of Jesus. And this brings fresh hope and strength. Amen. Amen. The GPS system is what, is, what I can easily relate to now. When you, you, you're driving, in Nigeria now it works, but I saw it first overseas. If you miss your way, if you don't follow the direction... You know, at a quarter mile, turn left, at the next exit, da 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 it guides you till you get to your address. But if you miss your turning, and you wind up in a wrong place, it will tell you to, give it some time to recalibrate. It will help you to now start your journey from where you are, so that you can still get to your destination. It might take a little more time, but you will still get to your destination. It's called recalibration. What does that mean? No matter the mess you've made of your life. No matter the mistake. 
that you've made. The Holy Spirit is more than willing to help you retrace your steps so that you can still get to your point B from your point nowhere. You left point A to go to point B. You wound up in point zero. It can take you from that zero or O or N or P or R or S-T-U-V and still take you to point B. Are you getting what I'm saying now? And it doesn't condemn. It gently corrects us with love. So for a child of God, nothing is hopeless. Even the most seemingly hopeless situation. Now, let me tell you what. When you hear it's hopeless, it's hopeless, a hopeless case, it's just the devil trying to embarrass you and harass your mind and tell you to give up and quit and die. With God, all things are possible. Can I have an amen? Can I have a better amen? Are you, are you joyful this morning? For example, John 14, 1. Let not your, excuse me. <coughs> let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. It can be a word that the Holy Spirit will bring to you. You are afraid, but it can bring that word. And that can be your solution. Go to verses 20, 26 and 27. John 14, 26, 27. Quickly. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit will remind you the words of Jesus. When you call on God for help, the Holy Spirit will swing into action and remind you the words of Jesus. You've read it before. You've meditated on it. But because of the heat of the moment, you forgot. You've forgotten completely. The part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to remind you. Verse 27. It says, peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You say, oh, thank you, Jesus. And you receive that word from the Holy Spirit. And then you find strength, you find comfort. Let me give you another example of the words of Jesus that the Holy Ghost can bring. John 16, 33. John 16, 33. Then I'll go to my point number two. John 16, 33. Glory to God. John 16, 33. Let's read that together, everybody. One, two, go. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have what? Tribulations. But be of good cheer. I am about to overcome the world. Jesus, you have overcome the world. Sometimes it's a good song like that that the Holy Ghost will bring to you. And it will just make a whole lot of difference. The same you two minutes ago, crying and wailing and rolling on the floor and wanted to end it. All of a sudden, just a song comes into your spirit and you receive it and you sing it and then tears rolling down and you begin to wipe your tears and you are moving, you are transforming from crying to smiling then to laughing in the Holy Ghost and that's your deliverance. Can I have an amen to that? That's part of what the Holy Spirit does. He's a real person, ever-present help. He's our helper, our standby. When you say somebody's a standby, he's standing by you. Most people are not standby. They stand by when everything is fine. You have money to dole out. You can take them out for lunch and afford to spoil them with 25,000 naira lunch in one sitting. Shandies. It's a nice place. Someone say, ah, oh, 25,000, pastor. There's no way in Ibadan. You spend 25,000 for lunch. It's not far from here. It's a stone's throw. Took my family there one time and we had a good time. I said, look, I want okra with, with seafood. And, and pounded yam as an ondoma. And everybody made their request and then we asked for drink. Uh, mo mojito, I think it was Mojito I asked for. Something like that. Is it Mojito or Mojito? Ladies and gentlemen, we enjoyed everything. Until they brought the bill. <laughs> when I saw the bill, I smiled. <laughs> I was like, oh, bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> you know when you laugh outside, but inside I say, <laughs> Uh, your mom, <laughs> it is where another time. I think a week after, we're driving past the place again. My children said, they, my, my daughter, especially, you, you know, daughters and daddies, they have, they have their way. Yeah. Daughters, they can manipulate daddies a lot, they're mischievous many times. 
wonderful, blessed, highly favored, anointed, but they have their way. She said, Daddy! I said, Yes, baby! Shandy's! I said, Pfft. What you talking about? <laughs> you want us to go to Shandy's with your school fees? How about that, baby? No, Daddy, no! And the next moment, she stops talking to me. Until we get home. And then we'll get home and then she'll stop talking to me. Until I come to her room and say, come on, what's, what's, what's the matter? And, uh, even my wife will not agree. <laughs> my wife will calculate very well. <laughs> Honey, <laughs> you know that uh, the school fees of this one, here, and you know that skinny, ah. thank you, my wife, God bless you. Because if, if, if <clears throat> anyway, oh, okay, let's move on quickly. I'm giving you too much information, TMI. Let me, let me give you another point, point two, and then I'm going to stop there. Then we'll continue next week by the grace of God. Point number two. Another advantage is that he supplies staying power. The Holy Spirit supplies staying power. The power to stay. Listen, church. Anyone can fall like a pack of cards under pressure unless we are helped by the Holy Spirit. Even the best of us, the best of us, go and listen to generals, God's generals, they will tell you, there was a time in their lives they thought it was over. And people had to preach to them what they had preached to the people. And you will say to the person encouraging you, that sounds like me. Say, yes, I have that from you. Oh, okay. Unless we are helped by the Holy Ghost, any of us, the best of us, man at his best is still a man. Can fall like a pack of cards under pressure. But however, the Holy Spirit reminds us. He reminds us that what you are going through is not the end. He reminds us it is common to man. Oh, this was brought comfort to my heart a few days ago as I walked the compound in my house. As I was walking, taking a walk. First Corinthians 10, 13 jumped at me. For there had no temptation taking you, which is not such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. But we'll, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. You know what the Holy Ghost said to me? It is common to man. It is common to man. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Two things I'd like you to note there. There hath no temptation taken you. You are already taken. This is different from, this is not theory. This is not how not to enter into temptation. This is you are already taken. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? There is a how not to get into trouble. There is now you are in trouble, in soup. How do you get out? There are no temptation taking you. All right? That's one. But number two, he said it is common to man. Let me tell your neighbor it is common to man. Preach to them. Say what you are going through is common to man. You are not the only one. You are not the first, and you are not going to be last. Tell them it is common to man. Somebody broke your heart. Oh, oh, that's my world. That's my world. That's my life. That guy's my life. He's my life. I told you in UI sometimes, some couple of years ago, a, a girl, a girl was shouting, "My life!" It was an open garden. My life. So everybody was wondering. Ah, who is alive? My life. Wait for me now, my life. So I got out of the car. I wanted to see her life. When I saw her life, it was not a, not a good looking life. The boy was wearing tattered clothes and he was wearing slippers on campus. And his hair was not combed. He was unkempt. I said, this is what your life looks like. People throw words around carelessly. So such a guy now breaks your heart. Ah! Your life. Her life is gone. Her life is broken. Not my life. Her life. What do you think such a girl will do? Look for hypo. Sniper. Listen to me. No material thing is your life. No human being is your life. 
Whatever you go through is common to man. If somebody breaks your heart, a better person is coming. Amen? Amen. They have been occupying space that didn't belong to them. So they need to move so that a better one can come. There is something called a square peg in a round hole. A square peg will not fit into a round hole. The misfit has to go so that the original will come, the real McCoy. Can I have an amen to that? A door closes, God will open a bigger one. It is common to man. Let me preach to your neighbor this morning and say it is common to man. In fact, I was thinking of making the title of this message, It is Common to Man. But I remember that the Holy Spirit woke me up and said, the Holy Spirit, the believer's advantage. So I said, sir, I will not argue. So maybe I will write another message another time. that will be titled, It is Common to Man. Maybe it can even grow into a book. It is Common to Man. Because when you remind yourself, or when the Holy Ghost actually reminds you that it is common to man, you come down and say, ah, it's true. Ah, it, me, no? ah, my God. it is common to man, Jerry. Amen? You fail the course. Oh, they must know you. My parents, my daddy, my mommy. It is common to man. If you ask your parents very well. Very, very well. There might have been once upon a time, time, time. When what has happened to you now also happened to them. It's common to man. Are you with me, church? Are you getting blessed? This is how the Holy Spirit helps us out of trouble. I'm talking about you have been taken now by temptation. You have been taken by trouble. But he's now helping you to get out. Most motivational speakers and a lot of preachers tell us how not to get there. Mm, but some of us have gotten there. How do we get out? This practical, practical, practical. Amen. It tells you, don't take your life. Don't kill yourself. Another chapter of your life is coming, and it's a glorious one. Then you find strength in his words. I close with these two scriptures. Ephesians 3, 14 to 16, and Colossians 1, 11. You find strength. You find strength in his words. Ephesians 3, 14 to 16. There, no, no, no. Come on, give it to me now. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by spirit in the inner man. Media has not found it yet. I've quoted it too. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. May you be strengthened with might by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. Because the Holy Spirit can strengthen you in your inner man. It's my daily scripture now. Make it your daily scripture too. Say it. Say, I am strengthened with might in my inner man. Strengthened. Strengthened. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because there are times that sincerely we become weak. Don't worry, I'm cool. I'm cool. We become weak. Looking at the circumstances that surround us. Say, what do I do now? Where do I turn to? Who do I talk to? And then you, be, you become gradually weak. But hey, there is somebody on the inside. And that is where it matters the most. For strength to come from the inside. Strength can try to come from outside. It's temporal. Sometimes when people encourage you, by the time they leave you, they leave with the encouragement. The encouragement follows them. But when the Holy Ghost strengthens you from inside, you are strengthened for the long haul. Amen? The same scripture repeated in Colossians 1.11. It says, strengthen with all might. Colossians 1.11. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. How can you have long suffering with joyfulness? Suffering long is long suffering. You suffer for a long time, yet you are joyful. For is you, but it can be done by the Holy Spirit. Are you with me, church? Strengthen. Somebody confess that this morning. Say, I am strengthened with all might. When you are strengthened with all might, you won't go and commit suicide. You just know it will pass. This too shall pass. Amen. God has delivered me before, He will deliver me again. 2 Corinthians 1.10, he who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust, that he will yet deliver us. He delivered Paul the apostle, 
when he despaired even of life in 2 Corinthians 1 8, he was pressed out of measure beyond strength. He said, We didn't know whether we'll make it out alive. Yet, God showed up. He said, we'll not, we'll not have you ignorant, brethren, of our trouble that came to us in Asia. That's not a good confession. Trouble came in Asia. Paul, don't say that. He says, Shut up. Let me tell you the truth. There are times of trouble. I found in my Bible, Psalm 34, verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. He didn't say few. He said many. But it didn't end there. Glory be to God. He said, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Can I have an amen? No matter what you are going through now, God will deliver you. God will honor you. Psalm 91, verse 16, verse 15, actually. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let me quickly give you the last point. Don't you think so? Number three. He helps us to intimately and personally know the love of God. The Holy Spirit helps us. Are you tired? Are you being blessed? The Holy Spirit helps us to intimately and personally know the love of God. Ephesians 3.19. Media, help me now. Just few scriptures and we close. Ephesians 3.19. Ephesians 3.19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. How can you know something that passes knowledge? How can you know something that cannot be known? It's the Holy Spirit. He will impart that knowledge to your spirit man. So that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's when you can sing in tribulation. There is, this, there is a hymn like that. All will be well. All will be well. One of the lines says, uh, faith also can sing in tribulation. That was why Paul the apostle and Silas were able to sing in the dungeon in the dead of the night. That's not the time to sing, that's the time to cry. Your back bleeding, your hands bleeding, your legs bleeding in stock, in chain for a crime you didn't commit. That's the time to query God and say, God, why? But rather, they prayed when they were done praying, and I'm sure they prayed in the Holy Ghost and they prayed in the understanding because Paul said, I pray with my spirit and I pray with my understanding also. And he said, in another place, I thank my God and speak in tongues more than you all. So they must have prayed both in the understanding and in the Holy Ghost. And he said, I sing with the spirit, I sing with the understanding also. So maybe he did some singing in the Holy Ghost. And Silas too was singing. And then they moved on to hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. And they moved on and sang in the understanding. And they sang and they sang and they sang a billion times. Like the choir sang this morning. But somewhere along the line as I was enjoying the song, the media projected one part. The choir did not sing it. The media quickly took it away. Oh, it pained me because I was looking forward to that part. God of your promise. You, you didn't sing that one. You, you, you. Oh, oh, oh. I love that part. I don't know the lyrics of that song. It's very long. Very long. Please put your hands together for the choir this morning. This is the month of worship is majesty. And I see that our worship is getting deeper and deeper. God will increase the anointing upon you. You will function in greater unction, under greater unction, the mighty name of Jesus. Plus all the instrumentalists and everyone in the name of Jesus. And the whole church, our worship will go deeper this month in the name of Jesus. We will worship in spirit and in truth. And the name of King Jesus will be glorified. He helps us to know. The Holy Ghost helps us to know. Personally and intimately, the love of Christ. Anybody can say, hey, I know God loves me, yeah. I know he loves me, yeah, from the head. But you really know from the heart that he won't bail out on you. Do you know from the heart? As I speak to you, I speak to myself also. Because there are certain conditions that arise and you wonder, ah, God, ah, what's going on? And you begin to want to doubt whether he really loves you or not. What's going on here? But hey, you need the ministry of the Holy Spirit at such times. 
to minister to your heart that you are loved of God. That knowledge, that experience helped me when I lost my mom. When all of a sudden I heard my brother here called me, said mommy went out, she didn't come back. <laughs> my mom was never someone like that. Didn't keep friends, didn't keep late night outing anywhere. I said to the Lord, as I rushed into my house and picked the car key, and my wife rushed after me, and we picked the children, and we're driving from Ashi to Mokola. I said, Lord, I know you love my mom. Wherever she is now, I know you're, she's kept by your love. Because prior to that time, the Holy Ghost had been teaching me about the love of God, the liquid love of God. I would have lost it mentally if he had not prepared me and taught me all of that. Because certain things happen and you can't explain. Why? My mom of all people. Ha! <laughs> you know when things happen and you ask God why? God why? But why? But you know what? The love of God is already shed abroad in our heart. And guess who did that? The Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5. 5. That love preserves your mind. Keeps you from losing it. Maybe your parents don't talk to each other. They fight. Maybe stuff is happening at home that can make you go gaga. But the love of God, the Holy Ghost reminds you that you are not an accident, you are not a mistake. You are God's idea. And he has a plan for your life. So don't lose it. Don't worry. They will still be alright. They will be fine. And you will be fine also. Can I have an amen? It is that love that keeps us going in the face of adversity. 1 John 4, 16. 1 John 4, 16. To know that God loves you. It is the Holy Ghost that helps you to know. 1 John 4, 16. We have known and believed. Let's read that together once we go. We have known and we have known and believed. What, do, what have we known and believed? The love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. We have known. The word known there is the word genasco. It's a Greek word. Genasco. It's the word used for sexual intimacy. When they say a man knows his wife, and then she became pregnant. You can't just know somebody's name, and they become pregnant. Abby? I know the names of many ladies in this church, but I don't know you in this knowing. And I will never know you in this knowing. In Jesus' name, amen. Because that is not the plan of God, it's not the will of God, it's contrary to the spirit of God. It happens in churches, happens all around. The devil likes to destroy every church. I don't condemn anybody, but it is not the plan of God. And for some of you in the congregation who have been knowing each other anyhow, Maybe, maybe, just in case. I don't know. I don't follow you to your hostel. I don't follow you to your house. Stop it so that it doesn't stop you. Can I have an amen? And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to tell you that you are better than that kind of lifestyle. You are better than that. God's plan is pure. God's plan is higher. Listen to me. Confess to yourself. I'm sexually pure. You might have made a mistake yesterday. Don't worry. Have you repented of that? You've woken up today. Today's a new day. I'm sexually pure. Now, say that with me, everybody. Say, I'm sexually pure. Upwardly mobile. Mentally productive. Spiritually vibrant. It used to be part of our confession. You can bring it back. Sexually pure. Oh, yeah. You know, you watched the movie last night and you know what you did after the movie. Shut up, Mr. Devil. I've repented of that. I've told my father. It's between me and my father. And I've repented. I'm sexually pure in the name of Jesus. Confess it. That guy will come again and want to kiss you. You push him back and say, mm, I'm sexually pure. Strength will arise from the inside. And there is no strength. He will bring his lips. You will join it. With yours on the way. And people don't keep their hands in their pocket when they are kissing. Their hands will go somewhere. And both of them have the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is witnessing, ah, no, this is wrong. Oh, Holy Ghost, please. 
Calm down, calm down. <laughs> For now, I beg. My life. This is my life right now. Stand on your feet, everybody. Have you been blessed this morning? We have known and I believe the love of God. The love of God is pure. Amen? So when I say I love you, it is pure. Tell your neighbor this morning, say I love you. With the love of God. That's, that's the purest form of love. It doesn't have ulterior motives. It's not sexual love. The Holy Ghost helps us to know. Listen, church. Listen. When you take a rope, when somebody takes a rope and they want to hang themselves, and the Holy Ghost reminds them, you are God's beloved. It will make a difference in their lives. When your business is not going well, like it should, and you are thinking of giving up, and the Holy Ghost reminds you that you are God's beloved, it will make a difference. I want to give you a scripture to meditate on. That's verse 18 of that 1 John 4. 1 John 4, 18. I want you to meditate on it. I also will be meditating on it this week. Let's read it together. One, two, go. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casted out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear has torment. I know what it means. I've been there practically. When fear gets into you, it will torment you. What can never happen in a thousand years, it will be telling you that it's going to happen right now. That in fact, it's happening right now. And you lose your comportment, you lose your composure. I've been there, I know. And these things are spiritual. I'll teach you someday about the man called Diabolos. That's a, a name for devil. The, the word translated devil in the Bible, in the Greek New Testament, is Diabolos. Tell you the meaning of that word. He likes to attack our mind every time, beating it hard, trying to pave a way into our mind, trying to torment us with tormenting thoughts. Please meditate on this this week. Will you do it? Even if you don't have a dime in your pocket, how are you going to survive this week? There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has what? Torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So I do not tolerate fear. Fear will come to you. It comes to all of us. Do not tolerate it. Speak to it. Are you with me? Are you with me? Speak to it and say, I rebuke you. I cast you down. I cast you out. Out in the name of Jesus. I am loved of God. Somebody say, I am loved of God. All eyes closed. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody in the congregation today that would say, I want to respond to the love of God? I've never really known this love of God.